Okay, so so last time we had a a somewhat um, brief uh, discussion of um, the notion of I'm just going to review briefly last time. We had a brief discussion of the traditional approach to the subject of asymptotic symmetries. And uh, we, the way that this uh, usually goes is you have some set of fields. It starts out as a classical discussion. And uh, you have some set of fields, for example, a mu. And you specify how the various components fall off uh, as you go near uh, null infinity. And um, then you, and typically you put some physical uh, criterion that uh, you, you certainly want to make the boundary conditions loose enough so that you don't rule out physically reasonable uh, situations, physically reasonable uh, field configurations, finite energy in particular. And, um, and then you generally try to make them as strong as you can without ruling out anything reasonable. That's the way uh, it's approached. And when you do this, you often find that there are uh, gauge symmetries, for example, in this case, we found that um, there were gauge symmetries delta epsilon uh, on A, which looked like dz epsilon of zz bar, which respect those uh, boundary conditions, yet uh, behave non-trivially uh, at infinity, and therefore, in principle, might uh, lead to uh, might act non-trivially on the classical phase space or might act non-trivially on the quantum uh, Hilbert space. Ultimately, we're mostly interested uh, in, the, in the quantum problem. And this kind of analysis was first made by BMS in 19. 62. Well, there were, I guess, precursors of it, but that was really the first where this kind of thinking was systematically spelled out. And they found, they discovered in this way the so called super translations, <coughs> in which um, the retarded time, we'll go through this more later, but retarded time is shifted by an arbitrary function of the position uh, on, on the sphere. And um, there are, and we also discussed a little bit uh, very briefly, the to, to be uh, detailed later, um, associated super translation charges and uh, conserved quantities and uh, Ward identities and soft theorems. Um, then we went on to uh, state the uh, soft theorem in in um, in QED, which we can write as the limit as omega goes to zero plus of omega out uh, a plus out of q, where this annihilates a positive uh, helicity um, photon S matrix arbitrary in state is equal to omega times um, 
Oh, okay, we, uh, lim we have to take the limit on both sides. The limit omega goes to 0 plus omega times the famous Weinberg soft factor, which uh, instead of putting, I got a little tired of writing out subscripts on everything. So um, I'm just going to write this superscripts on everything as QK, uh, the charge of the kth particle. So we imagine that uh, our in and out states can be described by some set of particles with momenta, incoming momenta PK in and incoming charges EK in and outgoing momenta PK out and outgoing uh, charges, sorry, QK out. And there's an overall factor of E here because of our, our uh, normalization conventions. Uh, but I'm going to drop the out superscripts, and I'm going to write it like this. Here, epsilon plus is a positive helicity polarization vector, epsilon plus dot Q equals 0. And we divide this by Q dot Pk, Q is the momentum for momentum of the outgoing cell photon. And then we have minus the same thing. I guess I'm getting lazier and lazier about writing all these things out. K and N, identical expression. So, okay, there are different ways of writing this expression. Um, before I was putting superscripts out on there, and superscripts in, now they've gotten used for it used to it, I'm going to drop those superscripts and um, just let, if we have n incoming particles, then we can denote the incoming momenta by p1 to pn. And um, if we have m outgoing particles, we can denote the outgoing momenta by um, uh, pn plus 1 to pm plus n by k go equals n plus 1 to n plus m. So we can distinguish incoming outgoing just by this uh, label here. And um, in fact, one often sees a convention ad adopted in which um, we, uh, we, we define uh, inco ingoing particles to have uh, negative, multiply their charge by minus 1 because you can uh, characterize them by the, the charge which is leaving the Minkowski diamond, and then there would be a relative minus sign, and then uh, we could just write it uh, with that convention. That minus sign would come in with the charge, and then we would just have one term. Okay, so this is, um, and then in that convention, the charge conservation just becomes sum of QK equals 0 instead of sum of QK in equals sum of QK out. Uh, uh, all right. Um, so, but for now, I'm, I'm sticking with this convention. Um, and then we have times the same S matrix without the soft photon insertion. This is the standard uh, form of the soft photon theorem. And um, we wanted to compare it to a Ward identity that we derived uh, that was a consequence of the large gauge symmetry of the S matrix, spontaneously broken large gauge symmetry of the S matrix. And um, to do that, the basic formula is that if you have any momentum p mu, null momentum, there's another formula that we'll discuss actually today. Um, uh, so p mu we can write as the four vector p0, p1, p2, p3 as 1 z plus z bar over 1 plus z, z bar. And uh, z i 
times a minus i times z minus z bar over 1 plus z z bar. And then 1 minus z z bar over 1 plus z z bar. Uh, now, a null vector is characterized by three numbers because um, p squared is 0. And indeed, we have three numbers. There are four p's, but they're constrained, they're constrained to obey p squared equals 0. And here on the right-hand side, we have three numbers, e in the real and imaginary part of z. But we've orchestrated this formula so that this, the z that, that uh, appears here is the z towards which uh, the three-vector part of p is pointed. OK. And so if you take this formula, so p mu is uh, something which is, I mean, this is something that it, we've been doing over and over again. So we take this formula, this expression for p mu, we write everything in here. We do something similar for q, for epsilon, and so on. And then we get a just in, we just get the same soft theorem in a different basis and in, in, di in different notation. And then it is immediately recognizable um, as, uh, and pieces of this you're doing uh, in the homeworks. And it is immediately recognizable as the Ward identity that we wrote down. Now, let me make a, a sort of general comment here. So the Minkowski coordinates, ds squared is equal, the standard flat coordinates, eta mu nu, dx mu, dx nu, are manifestly invariant under translations. x mu goes to x mu plus any constant c mu. But if you want to verify uh, invariance under Lorentz transformations, I mean, it's not very hard. You've all done it. But it's a little more work. You don't just look at it and see that it's invariant under Lorentz transformations. And all of quantum field theory and all the textbooks are developed in this kind of formalism, where translation invariance, ma maintaining manifest translation invariance is the, the paramount consideration in writing down uh, any formula. And indeed, the wave functions that are used, e to the i p dot x, are things that transform simply under translations. They transform by their eigenstates of the translation operator. x goes to x plus constant. Now, for many, for many purposes, um, the Lorentz symmetry is more important. And, um, the Lorentz symmetry, which is SO31, which is a Lie algebra isomorphic to SL2C, acts on the sphere at infinity as z goes to AZ plus B over CZ <coughs> plus D, a formula where uh, AD minus BC equals 1. A formula which is uh, very familiar to, um, to anybody who has studied um, two-dimensional conformal field theory. And indeed, that's because this SL2C is also the conformal group, uh, the global conformal group of the two-sphere. So we're setting things up. A lot of what we're doing in this course is setting things up uh, in terms, thinking about things in terms of the sphere at null infinity and the natural symmetries which act on that sphere. Um, we'll see later when we study the super translations and the translations that these things act in kind of an awkward way uh, on, the, on the sphere at, at uh, null infinity. But the uh, Lorentz transformations uh, act, act, in, act in a simple way. And more generally, one of the things that were developed is you can think of 
um, the scattering problem in in uh, Minkowski space, if we characterize things by some energy or some quantum number that tells us how they vary uh, along scry minus, and similarly how they vary along scry plus, um, and we think of particles uh, uh, coming in at different points on the sphere and going out at different points on the sphere, we can think of this whole scattering process as a kind of correlation function on the sphere where some of these are incoming from scry minus and some of them are outgoing uh, at, at scry plus. And in quantum field theory, which we're studying now, um, and this is a, which we're studying now, these correlation functions must be invariant under uh, the global conformal group. So indeed, they look a lot like correlation functions in a two-dimensional conformal field theory on the sphere. And indeed, we'll see later on when we get to quantum gravity that the global conformal group gets, uh, in some sense, uh, which we don't yet fully understand, but definitely in some sense, it gets enhanced to the full local conformal group that appears in two-dimensional conformal field theory. So, so a lot of what we're doing, just to reiterate that, a lot of what we're doing now is just praising old results in quantum field theory in a different, uh, uh, in a different uh, language in which certain of its features, in particular its symmetries, become more evident. Now, we also talked last time about uh, the derivation of the soft theorem. And when you want to derive the soft theorem in this form, in the Feynman diagram form, um, you start with some scattering amplitude. And you look, you uh, add to it a photon with momentum q. And then you take that momentum to zero, and you look for the leading term. And so if this has momentum q, this ha has momentum p, uh, then this uh, has momentum q plus p. Um, and now this has q squared equals 0. This has p squared equals m squared. And in the computation of S matrix elements, according to the LSC reduction procedure, one starts with the Feynman green functions and then truncates uh, the external lines. So uh, this guy and this guy don't appear. This propagator and this propagator don't appear in the S matrix element. But this is a new one which was previously truncated. And the new one, which was previously trun truncated, goes like 1 over q plus p squared minus m squared. But since the truly external legs are on shell, this is equal to 1 over q squared, which is 0, plus 2q dot p minus plus p squared minus m squared, which is also 0. So this is, gives us a 1 over 2q dot p. So this is a ubiquitous factor, which is appearing all over the place. Um, it's a pole as q goes to 0. That's why this whole story is so important. It's much bigger than you, than you might have thought it was. And, um, and moreover, this is singular when q is equal to p. And when we go to um, 
these variables on the sphere, this becomes a kind of holomorphic singularity of the type which, uh, which we like to study. Um, Ah, well, we can't set Q equal to P unless um, M is 0. Right. Yeah. Okay. So when M is 0, we can set Q equal to P, and then we have a singularity. Okay. Now, when, so we don't have these poles when P is, is, is massive. But other interesting things happen this, when P is ma massive, which it, uh, well, that's going to be our first sort of new thing to, that we're going to talk about today. And then in addition, we need to include a factor for this vertex. And this vertex is obviously proportional to the charge of the particle. And then you have a coupling. So the gauge field which couples here is AA goes like epsilon A, the polarization, e to the i q dot x, where um, where epsilon dot q is equal to 0. So uh, we have q, and then we have a epsilon, which is dotted in to the momenta of these particles. But since epsilon dot q is 0, the only thing which can p appear here is epsilon dot p. So when we multiply all these things together, we get uh, q epsilon dot p over q dot p, where capital Q, and in general, we have one such term for each particle, and we get a sum, and there's a factor of the electric charge out front. And of course, to be more careful, you have to keep track of all the twos and so on, which uh, I didn't do just now. OK, so that is all. And we also, last time, the, the uh, coupling, if this is a graviton instead of a um, photon, the, uh, you still get this, this piece, but you have to replace this term by um, the coupling of the graviton to the stress tensor of the uh, whatever the field is that's running through that line, and that is PA, PB. That is, that stress tensor TA, TB will be PA, PB. So um, we get PKA, PKB over PK dot Q. And we also noted that this uh, formula is invariant under epsilon goes to epsilon plus q, because the polarization is ambiguous up to additions of q. It shouldn't matter what we use here. And indeed, if you shift epsilon by epsilon plus q, these two terms cancel. And the the shift vanishes by total charge conservation. Sum of qk is equal to 0, or in the notation I'm using now, sum of qk in is equal to sum of qk out. Here, um, the gauge invariance, again, if we shift epsilon by an arbitrary uh, vector lambda a times qb, we again get a p dot q canceling the p dot q. But then instead of sum of the charges, we have sum of the four momenta of the incoming particles. That's equal to the sum of the four momenta of, of the outgoing particles. Um, so there, it's global energy momentum conservation that is, uh, in for, that is imposing consistency constraints on the soft factor. And in the electromagnetic case, it, it was uh, global charge conservation that, uh, that was required for consistency of, of the soft factor. 
Okay, so that is the review of what we went through last time. And um, now I want to move on to talk about the case of massive particles. But let me pause and see if there are any questions about last time. I'll take a sip of water. Okay. So, massive particles. So, all of this was very much based on the structure of null infinity. And uh, if you have a massless field, like a gravitational field or electromagnetic field, um, time-like infinity uh, So time-like infinity, which is called I plus, is not really um, very important. In other words, if you you can s complete, it's a theorem that you can specify initial data for an electromagnetic or a gravitational field. If you specify it on null infinity, that gives you complete evolution uh, into the interior. Now. Way back in the 60s and 70s, Penrose and his group were, were trying to um, generalize this. They wanted to think of everything, and you know, in the Twister program and so on, they wanted to think of everything in terms of structure and null infinity. And the, but then there's a problem when you get to massive fields, because uh, massive fields if you just solve the massive wave equation, they die exponentially at null infinity. And, um, uh, and indeed, a massive particle never makes it to null infinity. It sneaks up here through, through I plus. So there were, in fact, an interesting series of papers, people trying to uh, make, find different ways of dealing with this. but. Uh, nothing, nothing um, useful was was ever really uh, found within that program. Though I think recently we we we've understood the the right way to think about this. So um, now, it's clear that you cannot associate. So when I drew this picture over here, I said that for null part, if we want to think of the S matrix as some sort of correlation function on the sphere, uh, and that things are coming in from null infinity, we can, and in, in this formula here with the P's, um, we can think of them as coming in from a point on the sphere at, at, uh, at null infinity. And, um, it's clear that that can't be true for massive particles because a massive particle can have uh, zero spatial momentum. It can not be have no velocity, just have zero spatial momentum. And then clearly there's no special point on, on the sphere. So if we're going to think about massive particles in this way, their wave functions on the sphere have to be somehow spread out in some special way. And so how do we understand what, what that is? OK, so, um, so what I want to do, so, but I have a more precise goal in mind here. Um, and the more precise goal is to derive this soft theorem. At, but the, in the process, we'll get, we'll get insight into this. We want to derive this soft theorem, which was absolutely no extra work for Weinberg to do it for, for massive particles. Indeed, they were really interested in massive particles. They were interested in QED and so on. Um, want to derive this, this soft theorem um, somehow by talking about uh, the symmetries. And so that means we have to know how the symmetries act on particles which go through I plus. And that's a little bit of a problem. That looks sort of problematic because, um, you know, 
in general, we have these gauge parameters, epsilon z, z bar, which are varying over the sphere. And so if we were to kind of cut off uh, a little piece at the top of I plus to try to regulate this, um, then, uh, you know, it wouldn't, there would be no obvious way to extend it into the, into the, this thing in, into the middle. Now, there are two approaches, there are two papers on this problem, one by myself and uh, Monica and, and Dan, and another by Campiglia and Lotta. And Campiglia and Lotta paper is much nicer, so I'm going to explain the way. <laughs> I'm going to explain. <laughs> our, our paper is, our paper is, it, it, it's kind of interesting. Our paper is, uh, we never chose a gauge. Uh, I, we somehow had the idea that it, that it was a bad idea to choose a gauge. Um, uh, but sometimes that's not true. Uh, so we, 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 pr we derived the massive form of the soft theorem from the symmetries without ever choosing a gauge. Uh, but um, Campiglia and Lotta chose a gauge. And the way that it worked out was so nice and it highlighted a lot of kind of underlying structures, which I think are really the correct way to, 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 to think about the problem. And you'll see that uh, as, as we go along. OK, so, so one thing you want to do, you have to do, so it shouldn't matter what, what gauge we, well, if we want to talk about massive particles, we need to know, we have these large gauge transformations. We need to know how the large gauge transformation acts on a particle that goes like, that doesn't make it to null infinity. Now, and once we have specified that, we're done, right? Because once we've specified that, we know how the A, we know how the hard part of the charge acts on, um, on the massive particles, we get an extra term in the uh, in the uh, for the hard part of the uh, large gauge charge, and then we can grind it through and transform to the momentum space variables and, and see what it is and check if it see if it agrees with Weinberg's result. So. Uh, uh, one way to do that is to simply to find a prescription for extending the gauge transformations uh, into the interior. Um, and you sh one should get the same answer uh, no matter, at the end of the day, you should get the same answer no matter how you do this. But if you do it in a nice way, it, it could should come out simply. And if you do it in a bad way, you'll have all kinds of terms which cancel each other, but it's not obvious why they should do so. All right. So, um, so what Campiglia and Lotta do is they choose harmonic gauge d mu a mu equals zero, which implies that the Laplacian on the gauge parameter, since delta a mu, is equal to d mu epsilon, it implies that the Poisson on the gauge parameter must be equal to zero. Um, well, we're just imagining, let, this could be quantum electrodynamics, the electron. So now, but now I'm just worried about um, extending this epsilon if I want to know how the large gauge transformation acts on the electron, I have to say how I'm extending the gauge transformations from, the, from null infinity into the interior. Um, OK, so um, does somebody have a question? Oh, OK. So. Um, <coughs> 
this has a general solution, epsilon, but we don't want to, we now want to solve this equation with the boundary condition that epsilon approach um, some epsilon of zz bar on this boundary and the same antipodal thing on the other boundary. OK, uh, so the solution to this is epsilon of xa is equal to the integral d squared q hat. In fact, let me write this as epsilon of q hat. For the purposes of this discussion, it's nice to <laughs> parameterize the boundary by the unit vector q hat, where q hat squared is equal to 1. So that's a q hat is a 3 vector, which is a coordinate on the sphere. So d squared q hat g of a Green's function, g of x a q hat epsilon of q hat where g must have two properties. Since box epsilon is 0, we must have the Laplacian with respect to x of g of x a q hat is equal to 0. And also, we must have that the limit as r goes to infinity on scry plus of g of xa q hat is equal to delta squared q hat minus x hat. Right? Because this thing, we want this to satisfy two. Uh, conditions, it has to obey the Laplace's equation, and it has to go to a prescribed constant on, at infinity. Now, one of the interesting things, and it's a property of the massless wave equation, is, and I'm going to tell you what G is in a second, it has the, but it has the property that if we uh, specify the epsilon to be a constant uh, u, a v independent constant down here, but with an arbitrary angular profile, and then solve for it with this mathless wave equation, it will be take the antipodal values, antipodally re related values uh, in, in, in the future. So this gauge knows about the antipodal uh, matching, if you like. Now, um, and it, as it sort of must, because it, this is a Lorentz invariant equation, and the antipodal matching is 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 Lorentz invariant. Now, there's a formula for G, and the formula for G is G of x a q hat is equal to minus the volume element on the sphere, the q hat volume element. And there's a 4 pi. <coughs> and then I have xa xa, the Lorentz invariant uh, length of x divided by q dot x squared, where the 4 vector q is null and its components are 1 q hat. Now, um, it's just two lines to check that this obeys the Laplace's equation. And um, it's more work to verify this property. But the easiest way to do that is it's easy to check that if, so if we, so this is a statement about what happens 
as x goes to null infinity. So as x goes to null infinity, if we take a uh, um, the point x goes to null infinity, this will go to zero like this will go to infinity like r squared. So this will go like one over r squared, but this will be uh, will not be blowing up. It will go to some number of order one. X squared is, I mean, if it's a, if it's a vector from the origin, it will just it will just be zero. So uh, the limit of null infinity if q is not equal to x is going to be zero. But then when q is equal to x, there's some kind of divergence there. And the easiest way to check that it's a delta function is to first take, is just to take this thing and integrate it over the unit sphere. OK. So this is a very interesting, uh, a surprisingly simple expression. Now, there's something really weird about this because, I mean, um, when I studied the scalar, first studied the scalar wave equation, the first thing that you do is that you do a Fourier transform and go to modes of definite frequency. And then you get radiative solutions to the scalar wave equation. And you find that they fall off like 1 over r at uh, null infinity. And um, it was a surprise to me, though I guess some people must have known it, that there are solutions to the massless uh, scalar wave equation, which don't fall off at null infinity. They go to constant at null infinity. But those constants, they have take finite non-zero values at past and future null infinity. But their, 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 um, their values cannot depend on u or uh, they, they can't depend on v down here, and they can't depend on on u up there. And so there are solutions of the wave equation of that form. And so in one of the homeworks, uh, and you can write them down uh, if, if we say give w the wave equation factorizes into spherical harmonics. So we can write it as a spherical harmonic times some function of, of r and t. And I, I, I gave as a homework problem solving this, assuming that epsilon is proportional to a spherical harmonic. And um, it's a pretty non-trivial function, which does not have a, a, a Fourier transform. And so you miss it when you go to uh, energy uh, eigenmodes of, of, um, of the wave equation. OK, so. Um, Well, you're going to do that in homework problem. <laughs> Though I think it probably follows from, uh, you could probably deduce it from Lorentz invariant without ex without explicitly solving the, the 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 wave equation. And you could probably also just deduce it from the screens function. Now, of course. You could derive epsilon. You could try to derive epsilon by, uh, this isn't how I asked you to derive it in the homework, and I actually think it's harder than what I asked in the homework. But if we just put in a spherical harmonic here, um, then um, here's a formula for g. You could try to do the integral. I think it's a hard integral to do. I think it's probably easier to. Well, I, I never succeeded. Well, I guess after you know the answer, that tells you what the integral is. Okay. okay. So, um, so that's our that's our gauge parameters. Looks a little strange, but now we can make it look a little more familiar. And the way we make it more familiar is we describe it not in these coordinates, which are the coordinates which are natural if you're trying to study things which are translationally invariant, but in a different kind of coordinates, 
which are natural if you're trying a different kinds of coordinates of Minkowski space, which are uh, natural if you're trying to study how things transform under Lorentz transformation. So um, this is the so-called hyperbolic slicing of Minkowski space. So let's introduce a new coordinate tau squared, which is minus xa xa. And um, which is equal to t squared minus r squared. So t squared uh, minus r squared is invariant under boosts about the origin. And so, so um, So surfaces of fixed tau, so a boost doesn't change tau, so that maps surfaces of fixed tau in into themselves. So here's the origin, and we've drawn here the light cone of the origin, and surfaces of constant tau look like this. So these surfaces are Euclidean ADS3, or the hyperbolic 3 space, H3. And these surfaces, these are connected by rotations. The cross section here is a two sphere. These surfaces are uh, three dimensional, the sitter space. And by the way, this kind of slicing of Minkowski space, um, what we're eventually going to do here is to use this slicing to, if you like, resolve the singularities up here. We're going to take a more careful look at it using this slicing. And that's what really Kim Pigley and Lotta were advocating. And this kind of slicing the same slicing was actually used 30 years ago by Ashtakar not to study, um, you know, if you want to study time-like infinity, you want to study the ADS3 slices, Euclidean ADS3 slices that are asymptote to the time-like infinity. He was using the De Sitter slices to study space-like infinity. Um, so it's a it's an old uh, it's an old trick and we can at the same time define a coordinate rho which is r over the square root of t squared minus r squared a kind of radial coordinate so tau goes like this and rho is a radial coordinate on these uh, slices, tau labels the slices, and then of course we have the angular coordinates. And one finds that up here we have, um, which is the region we'll be interested in, ds squared is minus d tau squared plus tau squared d rho squared over 1 plus rho squared plus rho squared d squared x hat. So this is the round metric on the unit 2 sphere. And this is uh, ADS3. And um, of course, it's well known that um, SL2C, well, for Lorentzian ADS3, the isometry group is SL2R times SL2R. But for Euclidean ADS3, the isometry group is SL2C. And so we're familiar. So Lorentz transformations in Minkowski space um, act on, on each of these ADS3 slices, mapping them into themselves. Similarly, it maps, acts on each of the DS3 slices. Uh, in a way that those of you who have 
studied uh, uh, ADS3 and DS3 uh, are undoubtedly familiar with. Okay, so now um, it's not too hard to see that um, I won't go through it, but one can rewrite the One can rewrite this Green's function, which looks so, so kind of unfamiliar, uh, in terms of the new coordinates, g of tau rho x hat. That labels the point in Minkowski space. And then q hat, which labels the point on the asymptotic sphere. And that's equal to square root of gamma of q hat. That thing just stays there. We're not doing anything to q. We're not doing anything to 4 pi. And then we get square root of 1 plus rho squared minus rho q hat dot x hat all squared. Notice that tau has completely dropped out of this expression. d tau g is equal to 0, which means that d tau of epsilon will be equal to 0. Moreover, this expression was, is something, this expression, not, not that one over there, but, well, maybe that one over there too, but this expression has been studied ad nauseum in uh, the context of studies of, of ADS3, and it's called a bulk to boundary propagator. In other words, in studying, the problem often arises uh, in, in, in studying ADS3, one wants to relate quantities on the boundary, uh, in tr uh, quantities in, write quantities in the bulk in terms of quantities on the boundary, and you need this bulk to boundary propagator, and you have a formula which just looks just like that, relating bulk quantities to boundary quantities. And so we're beginning to see now that a lot of this kind of holographic story that goes on in anti uh, de Sitter space is, uh, can be repeated uh, in, in uh, Minkowski space. Um, and for doing so, it's particularly useful to use uh, this, this holographic, uh, this hyperbolic slicing, which oddly we were led to. <laughs> oddly, we were led to this hyperbolic slicing as a nice way of describing solutions of this equation. Because if you write uh, this equation in terms of this hyperbolic slicing, we find that epsilon simply doesn't, doesn't depend uh, on the slice. Now you might say, OK, this is something really special here because this Green's function doesn't depend on tau at all. But there are analogous Green's functions for fields of different uh, weights and so on. And uh, what you find, what you typically find, is that you get some kind of power of, simple power of tau. Here the power is just zero. In general, you might find f for a field of some uh, scaling weight, we'll find that on, eventually we'll have more examples. For example, when we do super translations, there's going to be a different weight over here. And we'll find that d tau of the appropriate thing is some constant times itself. In other words, it scales in a simple way. 
so more generally, we won't find things which are just, this is the simplest example, and when everyth everything is just fully invariant as you move from slice to slice and the whole thing just collapsed to an AD ADS3 problem, more generally, um, we'll find that, uh, uh, you know, we have various, various kinds of scaling weights um, appear. So that is one thing that I, that I liked a lot about uh, this approach to it, is that it, it, it uses a lot of very natural uh, structures uh, uh, of Minkowski space that are relevant to the way that we want to think about things. OK. So we've solved this. We have an epsilon. Uh, and now we want to suppose now we have, let me get a different color of chalk. We have some kind of massive particle which, uh, which um, you know, has some trajectory that looks like this. What is the phase we associate with such a particle? Well, what we imagine doing is instead of, so how, 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 how does this problem fit together? Well, before we were just taking, we started out with our charges as surface integrals. And then we um, extended them as bulk integrals up to here. And we didn't have to worry too much about the endpoints of, of these integrals because there was nothing up there. Now we want to um, be a, we want to have a closer look at this. And so what I want to do is to take slices like this. So take our slices like this at constant tau, and then let tau goes to infinity. So I'm being very precise about exactly how I'm ending my slice near time like infinity. So I'm going to start with a slice like this, and then I'm going to take a limit as tau goes to infinity. And something very nice is going to happen in that limit. We're going to get a simple formula. And so, um, so OK, let's talk now about massive particles. So for massive particles, uh, m squared, of course, is equal to e squared minus p squared. And x, at late times, in general, x is equal to, um, well, it's equal to p over t, p times the velocity times the time, and just a free particle. So at, at late times, our massive particles are not interacting. They're just moving at some constant velocity, which might be 0, and plus a constant. But since we're going to late times, we're not going to be worried about this constant. And um, x hat, the unit vector, goes to p over p. But um, now what I want you to do, so I'm going to give you all two minutes. I want you to find out what does rho go to. So rho was defined, where did rho go? Ah, here's rho. What does rho go to at late times? <laughs> well, some some vector, right? At t wherever it is at t equals zero. Yeah, I mean, it's just a free particle. So 
but I, we don't care about this because we're going to late t. these yours. Can I borrow one? Okay, I guess that's about two minutes. So, so, um, so rho squared is equal to r squared over t squared minus r squared, which according to this, we can write as p squared t squared over e squared. r squared is, of course, just x squared over t squared minus p squared t squared over e squared. The t's cancel. We multiply the top and the bottom by e, and this is equal to p squared over e squared minus p squared, which is equal to p squared over 
over m squared. So rho goes to the absolute value of p over m. So um, now, this is nice because that means that uh, at late times, now this is not an exact formula because in general x is not exactly equal to that, but it's true at late times. So uh, let me draw a picture of, of what's happening here. Let me draw on this picture lines of fixed rho but varying tau. So one of them is rho equals 0, which is the origin. Then another one would look like this. Another one would look like this. And then over here they look like this. Now, what this is saying is that um, asymptotically, if we have a particle, any particle moving with constant velocity in the absence of external forces asymptotes to one of these lines. Now, epsilon is constant along these lines. So this is a nice thing that happens. The gauge transformation, epsilon, is constant along these lines. So in this gauge, we know exactly what phase su uh, such a particle should get. It should get e to the i q epsilon of rho q hat. Right? Epsilon depends only on rho and q hat. It doesn't depend on tau. So we know exactly what phase uh, we, should, we should ascribe to this. And we determined that epsilon, if you like, by using the boundary epsilon and then putting it into the interior of the ADS3 of the hyperbola, which is all that we, we cared about using this, this bulk to boundary propagator. OK, so now that we know what the, the phase is, uh, you know, we had a Q hard acting on, on states P1 through PK. Uh, and we, we said that um, uh, if it's a massive for massless particles, we had, uh, we had terms like epsilon evaluated at, let's suppose the first particle is massless at z1, the point on the sphere, z of p1, z bar of p1. That's what the hard part of the, of the, of the uh, um, large gauge charge gave us, the contribution that gave us. But now for the massive particles, we have, if p is a massive particle, we have epsilon of, so this is the boundary epsilon, but here we need to use the, the bulk epsilon, epsilon bulk, evaluated at the point absolute value of p over m, and then uh, x hat, p, which would be p over absolute value of p. OK, so now we know in the Ward identity what to do with the, with the mass of particles. And uh, so now it's just a matter of uh, a long calculation to show that, this, that the Ward identity you get with this agrees with the Weinberg soft theorem. And of course it does, otherwise I wouldn't wouldn't be telling you this, and I'm not going to go through that. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not going to go through that in 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 class. So, I think the pretty way that this worked out 
is instructive of the fact that uh, this, this hyperbolic slicing of Minkowski space is, um, is, is very useful and efficient for, for, for studying these, uh, these kinds of symmetries. And I think that will only become more true as, 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 as we uh, progress. All right, let, uh, are there any, let me first ask if there are any questions about this. Okay, let's take our five minute break and uh, reconvene. So, uh, an interesting question about uh, the soft theorem uh, that you might ask is, is it exact? Now, the, the, all the uh, derivations you will often see in the literature of this statement that um, the soft theorem has no corrections. But when you look at it, what is really meant is that it has no corrections in the soft photon theorem I'm talking about now, is th that it has no corrections in perturbation theory. So people look at um, Feynman diagrams, and the argument is essentially based on Feynman diagrams, and that there's no way other than these external legs of getting a pole in, in, the, um, in the scattering amplitude. But um, we might still ask, well, what about things that can't be described by Feynman diagrams? Is the soft theorem true uh, non-perturbatively? And of course, if you want to ask whether or not the theorem is true non-perturbatively, the first thing you need is a theory that exists non-perturbatively. So we can't use QED. In some sense, the soft theorem is exact in QED, but QED doesn't ex actually exist as a quantum field theory because of the Landau pole. Be and and um, so we need some kind of, in general, to get a, a, a theory which exists non-perturbatively, you need to uh, embed it in a, um, a theory with some bigger, usually an asymptotically free theory with a bigger uh, gauge group and or, 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 or a finite theory. And I believe it to be the case that in all the examples that are known that um, such theories contain magnetic monopoles. And there may be a counterexample I, 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 I haven't heard of, but I don't know of any example of a theory with electric charges that doesn't also have magnetic monopoles. And whether or not that's the case, it's certainly uh, interesting to ask whether the soft theorem uh, gets corrections in theories with magnetic monopoles. And it's immediately obvious that it does. And so why, why is that obvious? Well, uh, let's suppose we have some uh, um, scattering process where we, com we create a monopole with uh, magnetic charge G, well, moving monopoles radiate their electromagnetic objects. So there's going to be some kind of uh, coupling of the photon to that. And, um, and then when we do LSZ to truncate uh, these external lines, we're going to get the famous 1 over p dot q here uh, times some vertex factor, which, which, we have to, uh, which we have to work out. And so, so, so what is that term? What, what does that look like? Um, yeah. 
if it's right if n no 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 wait if it's just QED well if it depends what exactly what you mean by that question if you are at energy so low that you cannot make a an outgoing state which uh, which has magnetic charge then you would never have to worry about this diagram. This would not modify the soft photon th theorem for what? I mean, it would. Oh, yes, it will. Even if it, even if it also would have yes. Just think about it. You've, you've got, a, you've, <laughs> you've got a, a monopole going out here. Well, but it requires the monopole to be a final state. It requires the monopole to be a final state. The monopole can't run on the or, or it's never going to be one. This is a black box. I'm not saying anything about what happens in here. No, I'm not advocating that we ever write Feynman diagrams with monopoles going in loops. And in fact, it's not a what? Well, QED doesn't exist, <laughs> so I, I don't know what the QED soft theorem is non-perturbatively. <laughs> It's if, if by low energy effective theory, you mean a low energy effective theory in which you do not include um, any particles with, with masses uh, uh, greater than some scale, then you're not considering such, uh, such, uh, such processes. However, one often talks about a low energy effective field theory. Indeed, you know, there were searches for monopoles and gut theories and what, what their, what their right, yeah. signatures would be in low energy effective field theories. And one talks about processes above the, you know, above the scale of, uh, of. So you could imagine, um, Ah, but but even right. So this these corrections to the soft theorem will be important if you have processes like you know the I don't know you know like the Manton where you have monopole scattering. So we can consider a low energy effective theory in the sector of the Hilbert space with magnetic charge G, right? G n. So n magnetic monopoles. And then we can scatter them. And um, we, we want to know that if we take those scattering processes. So there's a low energy effective field theory in the sector of the Hilbert space for low lying excitations above the sector of the Hilbert space with, with uh, n magnetic monopoles. Low lying monopole excitations. And um, and so so in that case, if the monopoles are scattering, if they're um, if the magnetic dipole moments actually so that's the important thing. If the magnetic dipole moments are changing through the scattering process, then these the soft theorem will matter. And more generally than that. You might so in low energy effective field theory, this the formula I'm going to derive has this significance. You know, it might also be important in you know where you have magnetic Wilson lines and 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 I mean this is related re, re, related to that. But more generally, you might want to ask. That's not the only question we would want to ask. There's some theories that do exist which which have. Uh, magnetic monopoles and we would want to ask you know is there some sense in which there's a non-perturbatively valid soft theorem in other words if we imagine that we could 
have a theory in which we can compute scattering amplitudes non-perturbatively. And, um, and then we take those non-perturbative scattering amplitudes, which are not computed by Feynman diagrams. Right? If you want to have some monopole pair production, there's you know, instanton thing, you know, there's complicated non-perturbative ways of computing that. Um, you want to ask for that scattering amplitude where the black box is not a bunch of Feynman diagrams, is there still a soft photon theorem? We know for sure that if there are magnetic monopoles, well, you'll, by the end of the lecture, we'll know for sure if there are magnetic monopoles, the usual Weinberg soft formula needs to be corrected. And I'm going to write down a formula which is probably, I mean, uh, let me conjecture, not prove, that it's a non-perturbatively uh, exact formula for, for soft photon scattering. And that is also of interest because, um, you know, there's a lot of study, for another reason, there's a lot of study of duality in field theory, huge subject over the last uh, 20 years. And now we have soft theorems, and we'd like to know, and these are r rather complicated functions, and they have to transform properly under uh, duality transformations, and that may, may give you know, interesting uh, constraints on duality properties of quantum field theories with abelian, with abelian gauge groups. OK. So, um, So we want to figure out what this um, magnetic corrections to the soft theorem are. And to do that, let me start out by writing the soft theorem in a way that is slightly the soft factor. So we have k in out, ek. So I'm going to define EK as really, it's what people usually mean by the electric charge. It's E times QK. Um, PK dot epsilon alpha, this is a soft theorem for, with a photon, for photon with polarization epsilon alpha, over PK dot Q minus the same thing for the ingoing state. That's the soft factor. Now we want to consider a theory with magnetic monopoles. That is, we have things with charges gk, which are 1 over e times the integral of f over a two-sphere which surrounds the charge. And so ek times gk prime is in 2 pi, usual Dirac quantization condition, is in 2 pi times an integer. OK. Now, um, to figure out how, what, what is this vertex here? Well, I can figure out what that vertex is by doing a duality transformation. And when I say duality transformation, I'm not, um, I'm not assuming any kind of duality symmetry of the theory. I'm just doing a field redefinition into uh, dual. Uh, it's well known that you can do a field redefinition into dual magnetic uh, variables. And um, so what is the nice form of the duality transformation? Well. We define f dual is minus 4 pi over e squared times uh, star of a, times the four dimensional dual of f, the Hodge dual. And we define a new coupling constant, which is 4 pi over the old coupling constant. And we define. Then we take the dual charges to be equal to 1 over 
uh, uh, yeah, 1 over E dual. So the, this thing was equal to 1 over E uh, integral of star f. And so this thing, the dual charges, then 1 over E dual, the integral of star f dual. And then the dual magnetic charges are G. Oh, but those, of course, if we now plug this in and use this, we find that the new magnetic charges are equal to, precisely equal to uh, the old electric charges. And that is the reason for my choices of 4 pi, so that this will, my normalization of my choices of 4 pi, so that this will be true. What we were calling, so this is just a field redefinition. We can write things in terms of F dual uh, uh, instead of F, in terms of E dual instead of E. And then we find that our new magnetic charges are equal to our old electric charges and our new Sorry, our new electric charges are equal to our old magnetic charges, and our new magnetic charges are minus our old electric charges. And the minus sign comes in because um, the square of the Hodge dual in four dimensions is, is minus one. That's right. Right. Well, so in the usual, so why am I doing this, right? So the problem is since this field, so magnetic charges couple to the dual, the dual electromagnetic field in the same way that the electric charges couple to the original field. So when you do this, you exchange the Maxwell equation and the Bianchi identity, right? In the old formulas, the magnetic charges is a, are a violation of the Bianchi identity, and the uh, electric charges are a source. Now, since magnetic charges are a violation of the Bianchi identity, it means that A isn't very well defined and it's a little bit hard to figure out what this vertex is. But in the new variables, um, it, it, it's, it's easy. But the new variables are smart, right? On the original, the electric is Right. So the smart thing to do is to use the new variables for, for the external magnetic lines and the old variables for the so we already know what factor we're going to get when the photon hits that. We don't know what factor we're going to get when the photon hits this, and that's why we're going to all this work to go to the new variables. Yeah, there's something very interesting that we're going to see that later that weirdly the duality, surprisingly, the duality becomes local on, on, on scribe plus, but I'm not using that fact just yet. Okay. So F is equal to dA. This is the original F. And for a soft photon, we have A is equal to E times epsilon alpha e to the i q dot x, where this alpha denotes the polarization. Then um, F dual is equal to, so now we're going to define a dual magnetic potential which couples to magnetic monopoles the same way that the original potential coupled to 
electric charges, to electrons. So F dual uh, is dA dual, and it's equal to minus 4 pi over E squared star dA. That is just that formula there. And now we want to write that A dual is equal to E dual epsilon dual alpha e to the i q dot x. So what is epsilon given? Uh, uh, so there's some relationship between, which we'll work out uh, in a moment, which becomes very simple on scry, between epsilon dual and uh, the dual polarization and the original polarization. Okay, but now, once we've written it in this way, we know that um, what now it becomes exactly equivalent computing this vertex in terms of, of um, in terms of the dual field becomes uh, a very simple job. Um, so we know that we, from the magnetic monopoles, we get a, uh, a sum, k, in all the outgoing magnetic monopoles of gk, which is the same thing as the dual electric charge, E dual alpha, uh, sorry, the dual polarization, on dual alpha um, times uh, pk, sorry, it's pk dotted into this. Sorry, I didn't write this very well. Let me write this a little better. So we just have a sum over out of pk dotted into uh, gk epsilon dual alpha over pk dot q. So that's the magnetic monopole uh, contribution. Um, and if we want to add back in the electric contribution, we have plus EK times epsilon alpha. So I remind you again that uh, epsilon alpha and epsilon dual alpha are both constructed uh, from F by solving that equation. Of course, that fixes them only up to multiples of Q. This formula determines the epsilon alpha is only up to multiples of Q. But we can separately shift either of these polarizations by multiples of Q, and we will, it will not change the um, resulting soft factor. Uh, if we shift this one, we won't change it because of electric charge conservation. We sh shift this one, we won't correct it because of magnetic charge conservation. So, and of course, there's minus all the ingoing states. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be a direct string. That's why we're going to the dual variables. Okay, so this is the formula, and you can check that this formula is, so we've seen another lesson here. For every globally conserved quantity, we get one soft theorem. There are really two globally conserved quantities. One is electric charge, 
well, we already saw we got a soft theorem from electric charge conservation, global electric charge conservation. We saw that uh, we got one from um, energy momentum conservation. That was a soft graviton theorem. Here we're getting one from magnetic charge conservation. We're going to get more later on from angular momentum conservation. And then there are going to be some others that are more mysterious. Um, OK. Um, and you can check. It's a, good, a nice exercise, actually, to check that this formula is invariant under uh, duality uh, transformations. OK. So um, now I want to talk about, so we have a soft theorem. So we better have some kind of, I'm worried about running out of time. We have a soft theorem. We better have some kind of conserved charge and some kind of symmetry. Right? We've sort of doubled, doubled the size of our, 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 our soft theorem. And um, so to do that, it's useful to write out things and uh, write out these charges in indices. So in the duality transformation, so we have f tilde 0 z z bar is 4 pi i over e squared f2 r u. Now let me just make a comment here. Um, so this i, com why is there an i there? Well, f is anti-symmetric. And um, so if you have an anti-symmetric, so f z z bar, the, but the complex conjugate of this is f z bar z. And that changes the index order. So f z bar z is not quite the magnetic field. It's i times the magnetic field. That's why this, that i is sitting there. I'll always get confused by that. And then we have f tilt. So this is just saying that the electric field transforms into the magnetic field at long distances. And f tilde r u 2 is equal to 4 pi i over e squared gamma z z bar f 0 z z bar. So we, you see if we you see that if we square this, we get a minus 1. And then we have f tilde u z. So here's an interesting one. Is equal to 4 pi i over e squared f, this is 0, f 0 u z. And f tilde 0 u z bar is equal to minus 4 pi i over e squared f 0 u z bar. So this is a very interesting formula. And it surprised me when I first started thinking about it. So first of all, it says that what is f u z? f u z is the radiative component of the electromagnetic field at null infinity, right? It's d u a z. It's the thing that tells us about radiation. And z is so d u a z. So z is transverse to to the uh, sphere at null infinity. So it's transversely polarized electromagnetic radiation is characterized by the profile of f u z. So under a duality transformation, electromagnetic du duality transformation, this transforms into itself. It's not a non-local formula. It just gets multiplied by i. And when you think about it, that makes a lot of sense because, um, after all, electropolarized electromagnetic, so f u z would be one polarization, f u z bar would be the other polarization. In a polarized magnetic wave, 
electromagnetic wave, uh, you just it w is complex, and multiplying by i just is a 90 degree phase shift, and so it interchanges electro and magnetic. So, so far from being non-local, at null infinity, the description of of the electromagnetic duality transformation on the radiative modes is just multipl multi very simple. It's just multiplication by i. Um, so now, what are the conserved charges? Well, um, the char conserved magnetic charge. Sorry, but the, I thought originally it was stated it's non local because it's non local in terms of the A shift, not the K shift. Ah, well, we're going to, oh. right. Well, that's good, good, good point. But now we're going to write that this is equal to DUAZ bar, and this is DUAZ. And then we're going to see that the field strength itself, the polar, the, the, sorry, the potential itself, which is the polarized wave, itself is just gets multiplied by i. Good point. All right. So, um, so the magnetic charge, which I'll do denote by a tilde, is just equal to 1 over 4 pi the integral of epsilon f, that is, um, if epsilon is a constant, this is just the standard magnetic charge. Now we're talking, uh, this would be scribe, at scribe plus minus. Now we're, we're um, making a local magnetic charge something which depends on an arbitrary function epsilon on the sphere. And in components, that's i over 4 pi, integral scry plus minus d squared z, f 0 z z bar. And again, um, by the matching condi conditions near uh, infinity, near, near spatial infinity, that will be equal to a magnetic charge, an angle-dependent magnetic charge defined at the future of past null infinity, which um, actually there's a funny minus sign here, minus i over 4 pi uh, scribe plus minus uh, d squared z f0 z z bar. Um, sorry, there's no d squared z here. I just <coughs> multiply, integrate. No, I guess I do want to write d squared z. Yeah, this is on scribe minus, and that minus sign comes in because uh, we have a reversal in the orientation in the, of the coordinates, the z, z bar coordinate. Epsilon z, z, uh, it's in the, on the scribe plus. Because we've done an antipodal map which reverses the orientation, um, if we take epsilon z equals i gamma z z bar on scribe plus, we have to take it equal to minus i gamma z z bar on, on scribe minus. Okay, there's nothing. Um, okay. Um, now, um, So now we could ask, what is the associated symmetry? OK, now um, the problem, so what we did when we, in the electric case, so previously when we discussed the large gauge symmetries, we, there were no magnetic charges around, and we demanded that F, we just imposed a boundary condition that Fz z bar is equal to 0 uh, at infinity. And um, and and then we just computed what the conserved electric charge is using the brackets. We just computed what the gauge symmetry was that they generated. Now, computing the Poisson brackets, 
without, when there are magnetic charge present, uh, and, or computing the Dirac brackets when there are mag magnetic charge present, and FCZ bar is not uh, zero at scribe plus minus, is actually a problem which hasn't been solved. Actually, we're, we're working on it, but we haven't solved it yet. And so we don't know, we haven't shown canonically that this, what, what symmetry these charges generate. But it's sort of, but it's obvious what they should generate. They should generate large magnetic gauge transformations, right? So they should generate uh, transformations under which uh, a dual shifts by dz epsilon. Now, if a dual shifts by dz epsilon, a, a and A dual are not independent variables. We can't use, we can't describe the theory in terms of both A and A dual. Um, we have to relate them. So there, there has to be some way of writing this thing. Well, we can write this, sorry, we can easily write this thing. We can integrate over scribe plus and we can write this uh, directly in terms of A and we get uh, some expression. So we can ask, what, do, what is the commutator of the magnetic charges with the electric potentials AZ? Well, if we solve this equation here, we find this gives us a relationship just integrating with respect to U. We learn that A tilde Z is equal to zero is equal to 4 pi i over e squared a zero z. In other words, it's just a phase rotation. And a tilde zero z bar is equal to minus 4 pi i over e squared a z bar. Zero. And I think I'm going to just go over like five minutes. And so if A tilde Z shifts by DZ epsilon under these magnetic gauge transformations, AZ, so delta tilde, by which I mean the variation under the large magnetic gauge transformations, um, with parameter epsilon of AZ0, according to this formula, must be equal to minus I E squared over 4 pi DZ epsilon. And uh, delta A, delta tilde epsilon AZ bar 0 is I e squared over 4 pi dz bar epsilon. So what that is telling us is that um, A, the original gauge potential A, is getting shifted. It, it, it's transforming under an imaginary uh, gauge transformation. So we have a complexification in terms of the original variables. We have a complexification of the gauge group. So let me now make some general comments about the implication of this. I think this had broader implications. So we've been studying these infinite dimensional symmetries. And we found that uh, in the case of electromagnetism, that um, we found that the soft photon theorem is, uh, is, can be thought of as the word identity of a symmetry which was a non-trivial subgroup of the gauge group. However, that everything seemed to fit together nicely there. 
However, one of the things we've learned uh, over the last, in the last 20 years, especially in studying quantum field theory, is that there can be many ways of presenting the same theory that have different local gauge symmetries. And in fact, this is the simplest of all examples in which uh, we do a duality transformation and we no longer have a local electric symmetry, but we have a local magnetic symmetry. And so this local, this, so this is definitely a new symmetry of the theory, right? There's ward identities, there's a, a, a a, uh, a, a, a soft theorem, there's a conserved charge, the conservation of magnetic charge, the conservation law for this guy is just not the same thing as the conservation law for the electromagnetic uh, analog. There are twice as many conserved quantities as there are asymptotic symmetries in the electric presentation of uh, of the theory. If we write in terms of the magnetic variables, there's another infinity of conserved charges and symmetries that we can understand at, in terms of a subgroup of the gauge group. But there's no obvious way of writing the theory in which all of these symmetries can be understood as subgroups of some uh, local gauge symmetry. And indeed, Nobody promised us, so writing, writing uh, theories in terms with redundant degrees of freedom is kind of an arbitrary procedure, and nobody promised us that all the interesting symmetries could be understood as subgroups of some particular presentation of, of the theory. And it might be that there are lots of interesting asymptotic symmetries and by an asymptotic symmetry, I mean very loosely something which acts nicely on the asymptotic uh, data in Minkowski space, um, that all of those um, symmetries could be understood as subgroups of gauge symmetries. That's what we used to think, but now in this simple example, we're, we're seeing that it's not true. And in an example we're going to study next week, we're going to look at the next week. We're going to look look at the soft Fotino theorem. And soft Fotino theorem, some kind of fermionic symmetry. There should be infinitely many of them, but supersymmetric QED doesn't have infinitely many fermionic symmetries that we knew about for it to be a a a, a, a subgroup of. So. <coughs> These symmetries, the ones we're discussing, are very physical. They're more physical than gauge symmetries. They give you relationships. They have ward identities. They give you relationships between uh, scattering amplitudes. They constrain the theory. And in many cases, so the lesson here is that in many cases, we can get them as subgroups of local gauge symmetries. But that's really only uh, the beginning of, of, of the story.